expecting them sending out news on that very shortly. If you're not regularly receiving our invitations, uh, let us know and we'll make sure you do. It's like that old, <laughs> I, I, I feel silly telling you that. It, you know, if you didn't get this letter, please let us know. <laughs> Uh, but uh, do let us know if you're not getting, getting our announcements and invitations. Um, we have uh, uh, several interesting programs coming up. We're going to have uh, uh, one on, on Iran, uh, and Iran and Central Asia in a much deeper sense, not just, you know, Washington, what's happening, what's ha what happened yesterday, but w what's happened over you know, five, six hundred years, and, and what are the intellectual ties uh, between the regions uh, today, and who maintains them? And this is going to be from a person I greatly admire, Professor Nasser, here in, uh, at, at GW, who's probably the best Islamist, without a doubt, the best Islamicist in the West, and former rector of, of Tehran University. Uh, and we'll also, this won't happen till uh, autumn, but we're going to hear uh, from Donald Rumsfeld here on uh, uh, the U.S. long-term interests in Central Asia and the Caucasus. Uh, he, he's agreed to do that. And we have quite a few other things coming up, so we'll, we'll keep you apprised of them. But today we have Elbek Saidov. Now, uh, Albeck is going to be speaking on, on water. Uh, and I'd just like to say, I mean, first of all, that Albeck is the reason I was so eager to have him speak on it is that unlike many of the, I mean, you, th this is a subject that is approached either by techies or by uh, who are fascinated by the hydrological problems <coughs> or by basically globe spinners who see only the, only the, the geostrategic problems. And the reason that I was eager to have Elbeck speak about this is that in his research here uh, uh, at the uh, 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 Central Asia Caucasus Institute, where he's visiting from the International Relations Department, Tashkent State University, where he's been. He's also, by the way, uh, worked for UNESCO, uh, he combines both sides. And, and that really is the, is the challenge, it seems to me, to, uh, as we address this issue. Before turning to Albeck, I want to, I want to mention that, that uh, um, there, there's been a lot of kind of condescension by international bodies, uh, including the UN, EU, other organizations, the United States uh, also, uh, on water issues, uh, sort of walking in and basically suggesting for one reason or another, you guys don't get it. That, 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 that uh, you know, that if only you did, if only women were more like a man, to, to, uh, to quote my fair lady, if, if only you thought the way we did, then it would be fine. But we're, I would like to suggest in introducing this that, in fact, uh, the reason things don't work da out the way one might wish, th that there are serious reasons. And you're dealing with people who are serious and competent. And that, the, and that the, they know much more <laughs> about the, this problem than the instant experts who've walked into this issue over and over again in the last 20 years to solve it for them. Um, and beyond that, just suggest one further introductory comment, and that is, I'm not the first to say this, but it is absolutely clear on the basis of, of, of the last half century's archaeological work that Central Asians actually developed the first and most serious technologically most sophisticated irrigation systems in the world. So they're not amateurs. You can say, what a tragedy 
you know, the Mongols actually went at, in a focused way, very, very strategic. They went at the irrigation systems, and, and many of them never recovered from the Mongol invasion. But Soviet, what did recover, was basically obliterated by Soviet Union uh, with its system, which is among the most primitive in the world. So this is, here is the paradox that Elbeck is going to be addressing. How do you, how when you have a, a deep tradition of extremely sophisticated, ecologically the best in the world, uh, water, water management, uh, this deep but lost tradition, and you have over it the most primitive system that is in place and that can only be a, replaced with billions of dollars from the international community, which no one has volunteered to put up. A lot of advice, not much money. How do you deal with it? And especially when it has, all this has such profound uh, geopolitical dimensions. So I hope I've set this up adequately. It, it's a real pleasure and honor uh, to introduce Elbeck and to say it's, it, it's as many of you have found out by meeting him these past months. Just a pleasure to have had you here. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for everyone for coming here and taking this opportunity, I wanted to congratulate, uh, to thank you, Professor Starr and the Central Asian Caucasus Institute for, uh, for accepting my candidature here, my research, which is uh, of uh, extreme importance for the region itself. And, uh, and today we're going to talk about water management in Central Asia. Um, and first, uh, I will be giving you a quick uh, uh, overview of the uh, roots of the problem in the region. And then uh, we'll give the overview of the challenges posed uh, and possible solutions. And so let me start with uh, what was just said by Professor Starr, so from ancient times, water was a vital source of life and well-being in Central Asian region, uh, which is a landlocked uh, region with a continental and arid climate. And uh, many civiliz civilizations have emerged and flourished in, in this uh, region. And in fact, uh, this was one of the cradles of uh, ancient irrigated agriculture. And <clears throat> let's have an overview of water resources. So as you all may know, uh, two main water arteries which uh, today cause many problems in the region are the Sirdarya River and Amudarya River, which uh, arouse in the high in the mountains of um, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Afghanistan that are uh, Tian Shan Mountains, Pamir and Hindu Kush, respectively. And, <clears throat> and the total water uh, flow, annual water flow of these rivers is equal to uh, 116 cubic kilometers. And why, why I'm giving this, this uh, figure is that following. So let's go back to the Soviet Union period after 1960s, the Soviet government undertook a large-scale diversion projects in the region. And by 1990, we see that the water withdrawals from this, from this water resources have risen up, and it's reached to, to, to that level that literally all the water, all the surface water was consumed for irrigation in the region. And here we have the problem of the RLC and all the um, bunch of problems related to that. So 
here you can see the diversion projects in the region and <coughs> uh, actually that that was a period of uh, complex network of development of complex network of water facilities in the region uh, that comprised uh, longest canals highest dams and uh, largest capacity uh, hydropower plants of course it left uh, positive development of uh, the infrastructure in place, but it, uh, the, uh, ex this extensive development um, and the over-exploitation of uh, natural environmental resources, mainly land and water, have created more problems in the region. S and <coughs> here, let's just give some examples of that. So Karakum Canal, which was then named Lenin, after Lenin, uh, its annual flow, it takes the flow from Amudarya, it equals to 85% of virgin flow of the Colorado River. Another example is uh, Rogun Dam, which uh, began, the construction of which began in 1976, and it it should be, it would be a highest dam in, in the world. And, but it left a lot of questions than answers. That is dam safety, environmental impact, social impact, which is uh, not assessed by, by um, experts, by expert society. And the next is Sayana Shushinskaya Dam. It's not, <coughs> it doesn't have any direct relations to the region, but it comes from the period of that extensive development. And we saw in 2009 how uh, was the outcome, the result of any minor technological, technical faults. So going <coughs> through this issue, let me say, that Soviet irrigation system was highly inefficient. It caused huge water losses through evaporation due to uh, long de delivery canals in deserts, uh, seepage and infiltration due to uh, one of the reasons of that was unlined canals and uh, run off into desert depressions. Mm. Today, this problem is mainly understood and uh, much is being undertaken by the countries themselves in the region. Uh, and there, mainly there is a process of decreasing of irrigated areas across the region. Uh, ex exclusions are Tajikistan and Turkmenistan. And water withdrawals are, have also slightly decreased here we should have some picture here. Yes, and <clears throat> here we are. And don't be shocked by the number in Uzbekistan. It is really the largest by, but here we should uh, take into consideration that uh, Uzbekistan has uh, more than half of the population of the RLC basin. And <clears throat> so, need for intro introduction of modern irrigation technologies and rehabilitation raises another sensitive issue here, lack of financial and technological resources. According to the World Bank and UNESCO's uh, early estimates, uh, the uh, renovation of irrigation and drainage systems uh, require about three, four thousand US dollars for per hectare of land. And <clears throat> so developing countries obviously will need support of international community, donor community, not only in agricultural reforms, but also in div diversification of economies, which has uh, already been uh, declared as priority strategy, for example, in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. <clears throat> 
And, uh, another issue is water problem in the region is related to various uses of water. As you may know, till 1990s, there was a water energy exchange scheme in the region uh, when the upper stream countries withdraw water for irrigation for downstream countries' lands, while downstream countries in return gave uh, electric, hydroelectric power, oil, gas, and coal for, for, for the needs of upper stream countries. And today this system doesn't always work properly. Economic difficulties and lack of cooperation led to con con contrasting, sorry, contrasting uses of water, that is hydropower versus agriculture. Kyrgyzstan, which lack, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, which lack uh, energy resources and do not have other resources for development, demand their rights for uh, untapping their huge hydropower potential, and which also includes construction of additional plants on transboundary rivers. It is natural, uh, it's, it can be understood, but nothing can be achieved at the expense of, uh, of the harm to, to other neighboring countries. And uh, the region is dependent on agriculture for securing, for providing food security. And it is one of the main uh, sources for employment in rural areas across the region. <clears throat> and it is important that uh, agriculture and hydropower cannot compete with each other. Uh, and uh, competing is a zero-sum game. So there should be achieved some balance of interest in this direction. The next slide is shows that <clears throat> additional stress on water resources is put by development of industries, growth of population, and uh, urbanization processes. And here we come to integrated water resources management. Uh, it is a, a approach, an approach which is promoted with by many uh, international organizations such as UN and UNESCO and the the main idea of that is uh, integrated inter interest of various sectors that is uh, industry which includes hydropower generation agriculture human uses and uh, <coughs> another principle is uh, ba basing on hydrographic approach rather than political boundaries and uh, public participation is largely needed and uh, sustainable development which also puts um, uh, into consideration the needs of nature of the environment for, for water so as we saw in the Soviet Union the, w the water was withdrawn and no water was left for the needs of the ecosystems. And <clears throat> so there are projects going on in the region. So uh, this is the, an example in the Fergana Valley. And uh, this t table here shows uh, the, how the water, res the water resources discharge uh, has decreased in the region. And it is an important direction of uh, development in this sphere. So here we come to geopolitical considerations. Develop, mm, sorry for that. Of course, it's not a secret that water can be used as a geopolitical weapon. And many experts underscore, for example, Russia's involvement in re regional water politics. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, region states may also wish uh, to, to gain some geopolitical power and uh, economic gains. For example, for example, Tajikistan, we see that one of the main drives of uh, construction, for example, Ragun hydropower plant 
is uh, um, expert of power to to South Asia, which will give we see uh, some economic and geopolitical gains in the region. So another issue is related to institutional and legal aspects. So far, the region um, achieved to 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 somehow resolve the problem in a peaceful way. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, there were uh, established a number of organizations dealing with water that are the International Fund for Saving the RLC, and within its structure there is Inter-State inter Commission on Water Coordination. So they have a ver very positive impact overall, but however, they often lack author authority and long-term decision-making in the region. And still there, there isn't any uh, basin-wide legal framework agreements covering all the states in the region. And the very interesting situation here is Afghanistan, uh, which has long been excluded from the water uh, relations in the region. But keeping in mind that uh, about 8% uh, of water resources in the region come from Afghanistan and there are plans for development of its uh, irrigation fields and also hydropower generation for the needs of e eco economy. Uh, th this country should be taken into consideration. And here, let's have at this table and it gives very interesting overview of water intake in the region and uh, the central asia is uh, is a is our leaders in in the world for uh withdrawals per per capita this is largely because of uh, uh agriculture and and the soviet system of irrigation but it is obvious that the uh, attitude to water should be changed and <clears throat> in order to address the problem correctly all, all these factors historical political geopolitical economic and social should be taken into consideration um, the water scarcity in the region is not related to lack of water resources but it is a result of mismanagement and supply driven approach countries should continue further diversification of uh, economies and uh, agricultural reforms. Uh, the other point is that all the parties should come to clear understanding of the benefits of cooperation and refrain from any kind of unilateral actions on transboundary rivers achieving the balance of interests. So the balance of interest is the most important thing uh, for example, to do today it is uh, scientifically proved that construction of uh, smaller dams mm, next to each other instead of huge dams is uh, better in, uh, in terms of cost efficiency. The bright example is, for example, India. <coughs> and the next is states should join international conventions on transboundary waters and establish multilateral agreements basin-wide and modify the regional structures including all the countries of the region plus Afghanistan and here uh, I will stop by again on integrated water resources management it can be a uh, viable solution so it is not tested in the region so it's so uh, the, the project which I sh show you earlier was uh, a pilot project in the Fergana Valley by Swiss Agency for Development and Coordination, co Cooperation. And, <coughs> and uh, the, the, the last thing here is wide participation of international community in water sector reforms. And, uh, and the, the region doesn't have any, d doesn't need any ready-made solutions it has a long history of uh, irrigation uh, and uh, 
there should be much cooperation with international experts on the ground. And before I finish, let me draw your attention to this piece of Central Asian ornament. It is very unique, complicated, and uh, extremely interrelated. And you cannot take uh, any piece of that. It will, it will not ma make sense. Solve the problem of water in the region. So all the, all the developments should be based on balance of interests and should <coughs> involve all the interested state, state parties. So this is it. Thank you so much for your attention. We'll be happy to answer your questions. Well, thank, thank you very, very much. Uh, this was a very clear and, and, and uh, exemplary, elevated approach to the issue. Uh, let me recall a, uh, I heard a Kyrgyz economist by the name, as I recall, of Mama Khanov, uh, speaking in, in Dushanbe. Uh, a few years back, and and he would have listened to everything you said and said, excellent, I agree with everything. Now here's a simple solution that is going to solve everything all at once, and that is simply put a value on water and treat it as a commodity. Marketize it. What's wrong with that? Do you want to comment? Yeah. Please. Thank you very much. I am Muhyiddin Tojiv, a visiting scholar from Tajikistan. And, uh, uh, you know, as for the uh, marketization of the water resources, there is a big debate over these issues among the leaders in the Central Asian countries, while the upper stream countries' leaders uh, consider that water resources should be marketized, but the uh, downstream countries' leaders think that uh, for extraction of water, people do not spend any cent. Therefore, water should be free. While for the extraction of oil and other resources, people spend some money. Therefore, oil and other resources are, um, cost some money. So it is very difficult to find, to find some kind of solution to this issue uh, based on the existing debates. Thank you. Anyone uh, else want to comment before we turn to you? Yes. Okay. Ambassador Siddiqui. Yes, I have the question uh, uh, about uh, what do you think about the percentage uh, of uh, uh, in uh, in the solving of the water problem in Uzbekistan, which could be recovered by the uh, by the uh, uh, by the uh, rebuilding uh, new irrigation system. You have two because, questions now. Yeah. So the first <coughs> is. Uh, is considering the water as eco economic good. <clears throat> so there, there is much debate going on uh, all, all over the world, and and uh, the reason why you cannot you know, implement this, uh, this uh, uh, principle in the region, because even on, in the world there is no consensus on this, and I just wanted to comment uh, on your uh, remarks uh, that, uh, so why, why we cannot put uh, a, a uh, put market prices for water? So there are some some region reasons for that. And in the region, people really they they discuss the the oil products and uh, what water resources. And the the main difference between these resources is that uh, uh, oil and uh, other uh, hydrocarbon resources. Uh, are non-renewable, while water resources are is a renewable resource, and uh, <coughs> so taking water for irrigation or anything, uh, the water cannot be taken out from ecosystem itself, and uh, and the and you also you you do not put any input for extraction of that. It's a natural natural 
uh, resource which renews itself and the other is consumptive use so after using water <coughs> uh, so water is not c is non consumptive really uh, in in comparison with uh, oil products and uh, thank you for your question and if i understood your question right How modernization of irrigation system for you know for your uh, water mm -hmm. demands in, in, in for agriculture in Uzbekistan. So, um, uh, Zamir, can I can I rephrase it? If the investment were to be made in greater efficiency, in other words, re replacing the Soviet legacy, what percentage saving are we talking about? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I, unfortunately, I don't have exact number on Uzbekistan at hand, but I can comment on the region. Uh, so, uh, according to estimates, uh, so the the current irrigation system causes uh, losses of about uh, up to two billion U.S. dollars for the economies of uh, of the region. And uh, if we address the uh, the matter of water efficiency, uh, water efficiency uh, in the region, all over the region, it includes all the downstream countries and partially Tajikistan also, uh, the water efficiency is uh, about 40-50%. Uh, so we see that uh, about half of the water resources are lost that is uh, that include uh, uh, runoff to into desert depression depressions by the way just one more comment on this nowadays there there is going on a, a construction of uh, the uh, of the great lake in the karakum desert by turkmenistan and uh, they believe that uh, this will help to to collect all the drainage water from Turkmenistan, and uh, uh, and uh, the sands w will help to to clean it up, uh, the, the pesticides, uh, herbicides will be sedimented, and they can they can use possibly in the future this water for irrigation and for other purposes. But uh, the, the, the example of, for example, Sarikamish Lake, which is on the border between Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, we see that the it will have a very negative impact on the eco ecosystem of the region because it's, uh, the, the water is highly salinated. And it, so it will create more problems than solve. Yes, please. Wait, here comes a mic. Okay. Um, just a quick question in regard to your classification of water as a renewable I a resource. I, I, don't, I don't question that at kind of a baseline assumption. What seems interesting to me is that often these discussions of water as a resource assume a, const a, a constant level of flow over time, when in fact what we've seen in Central Asia is that with some changes to climate, we're seeing some increased water on an annual level but that's actually drawing down some of the glacial flow. So what we're seeing is, if we were to look at this on a 50 or 100 year time frame, we might not see it continuing at these levels. And certainly as you get further down the river, as the level of use is up, it's not renewable if you're far enough downstream. So I'm, I'm interested, instead of kind of glossing this over and say, oh, it's water, it's renewable, who is it renewable for, and for how long, and at what kind of levels? Thank you. Actually, does it work? Actually, that is very important question. And uh, before turning to it, let let me give you one example. So, uh, some years ago in Bolivia, uh, there was a need of uh, improving uh, water management system. In, if I'm not mistaken, it was the city of Cochabamba. Uh, and <coughs> the government attracted to this uh, a private international consortium which in return 
demanded that the monopoly in the water uh, sector of the region and that market prices would be applied for, for water, water use. And <coughs> in, in, in some months, uh, the, the, the situation was in the mess. So there, was, uh, there were uh, the uh, large riots in, in across the region and the riots uh, continued till until the agreement with that consortium was uh, uh, denunciated. So, and here, <coughs> uh, why I I'm telling this? So, it is right that, that there should be a value for water, because which is not valued, you can use it uh, without any restriction, right? And <coughs> mm, uh, and here the question which is discussed is that the not putting market prices for water, but to take to take out uh, recovery costs for 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 supplying it for any needs and. Going back to your question, sorry for being very uh, precise. Um, there is a process of uh, increase of water flow w which will end uh, with uh, decreasing uh, because of the glacial decline upstream. <coughs> and uh, governments really should pay more attention to, to, to that matter. Uh, can I follow up, if I, if I may, as much for you as and everyone else? To what extent is is the catastrophic prognosis that your question implies uh, real? I there is a uh, what's his name, uh, great Tajik? Uh, no, who was doing the research during the Soviet times on. Uh, there was one guy in the Soviet Union who was doing the research on the on the uh, desiccation of of glaciers and and he was actually paying for it himself. He built his own machinery he'd fly it up there. I went up with him once up up into the uh, up up uh, up into the pamirs and and uh, measuring this and it was completely ignored. And uh, it's a kind of a really exotic figure. Now this question has been: uh, uh, Do you do you know his name? Either of you? Not Pap Papadiev. No. 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 Uh, now this question has been posed: What I is there a possibility of a real collapse of the of the uh, uh, glacial? Uh, uh, water systems in the mountains, and if so, I mean, th all our other discussions here are kind of trivial. Is this something to be thinking about? Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> 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 Thank you. I welcome any of your comments on this. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Elbeck. A very nice presentation. Thank Introduce you very much, yourself, uh, Star. It's a, it's a, it's a good. Uh, I like uh, this, this uh, presentation today. And uh, introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Sadridin Jenbekov. I'm from the World Bank consultant. Um, and uh, my question is uh, about um, uh, around, around, around water. I mean, not uh, just uh, about water. I mean, I'm talking about some some uh, political aspects of this, all this, this relation between uh, between uh, personal uh, relation between each president i mean in the central between kyrgyzstan tajikistan uzbekistan i mean you know um, in the soviet time as you mentioned uh, frederick it's uh, this is uh, water issues is not uh, it was it was not uh, an issue in 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 the region I mean, it was, it's none of the decisions were made there. Yeah, I mean, they, 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 <laughs> <laughs> they this is, uh, water was managed very well, I mean, without any problems in the Soviet time. But after the independence, 
it's uh, immediately this is issue is raised. I mean, it's a, and uh, you know, as far as I understand, a lot of economical solutions on the table. I mean, a lot of, and everybody can propose some 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 solutions. I mean, uh, it means it's not a it's a big issue. I mean, to find some op optimal scheme of the distribution of water in the region, but uh, you know, sometimes it's the political issues can't to take the chance to realize this is this, this, this is uh, proposals uh, and uh, you know uh, just uh, I'm uh, this just is leading to a question yeah 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 I mean my, my question is uh, do you have some any assessment in your uh, research about the political involvement for this is for this is issue thank you thank you for your question and let me first to comment on your point on, on Soviet time. It's, it raises sort of a very sensitive sensitive point, but it is it is contestable. It, it's it's misunderstood because uh, you're saying that water managed water managed good. So there weren't any political issues because it was within one state, right? But uh, the pr the problem of water, <laughs> I will not agree with that, because water water problems were, were at place uh, beginning from 1980s. So the, the problem is that the, the water problems in the Soviet Union were not discussed openly. Uh, the state will, will ca came to that only uh, in, uh, in 1990s, in 1985. And <coughs> as I said earlier, water intake from water resources was equal to uh, to surface water, which fed the RLC. So no water was left for RLC. For example, it's th it's the simplest example. <coughs> and uh, the solution of the Soviet Union, this integration of economic ties, uh, left to to. Uh, this integration in the water sector, of course, and here <coughs> we now deal with sovereign states, with uh, their uh, new national interests. Uh, they are, as Professor Star always says, they are very protective of their sovereignty, and <coughs> and uh, I would not speak speculate on personalities. But the the solutions is is on ground. So even taking the the construction of dams, right? It's uh, the region uh, with the in the nearest future will need more hydro power, more energy resources, and it it is obvious that that the cooperation at on this level from cooperation. Every state will will have benefit, and it is the main point in that direction. Very very quickly, you showed the Rogan Dam, mm -hmm. and the point that you made is a valid one. It's by golly the highest in the world, uh, if built. Uh, is there a way of building the Rogan Dam that would be acceptable to Uzbekistan? That is a very important question. <laughs> it uh, wasn't meant to uh, elicit laughter. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, and uh, the <laughs> so the Rogun Dam is not o only opposed by Uzbekistan itself. There there are, for example, Turkmenistan, and uh, here. Of course, there are solutions for that problem because uh, the government of Uzbekistan and some other states have already announced that they they are ready to invest in the infrastructure development. And I believe uh, the, the the countries uh, can invest to the construction of dams upstream, but that but uh, the downstream countries will need the assessment of the dam safety, uh, other concerns, environmental, social concerns, and uh, the, the and in case of 
Rogun Dam. Uh, Uzbekistan is supportive of construction of uh, smaller smaller dams in the region, and uh, this is it is some kind of so solution. So build for two smaller Rogun dams. <laughs> and yes, please, a, a, a Tajik response. Yes, <laughs> By the way, this is wonderful to see you all here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first thank of all, uh, <laughs> Elbeck, thank you very much for a very good presentation before just I commented, therefore I didn't want to take your time. And uh, you know, uh, here I would like to make a point that, first of all, of course we came here just to discuss the issues in order to find solutions. Uh, the goal of the construction of the Rogun uh, hydropower plant is not to uh, the export to South Asia. The primary goal is to uh, need to meet the needs of the population in the electricity. Sorry for taking your time, guys, but um, I am here in the DC now, and uh, here we have um, houses heated and uh, every. Uh, conditions are available, but uh, I hear every day from Tajikistan that in the um, rural areas, people have three hours of electricity per day. One and a half hour in the morning and two hours in the evening. Can you imagine what is the situation of population if they do not have coal there in order to heat, if they do not have wood there to heat their houses? They, we have children, we have a lot of people Sorry for these facts, they are dying because of the poisoning of the use of coal in apartments. This is the real situation. Therefore, Tajikistan is struggling for many years to construct this Rogun Dam. Its primary goal is not to sell uh, the electricity to but, South but, Asia. But why not build too small a Rogan Dam, or reduce the size so, of it. So uh, here I'm not the scientist uh, in physics or in construction who could say uh, why we should construct smaller Rogans but not bigger Rogans. But I would uh, ask a question to Elbeck regarding his presentation that uh, you also pointed out that uh, the construction of uh, similar infrastructures are supported and uh, appreciated in the region, but it should, they should not be constructed in, uh, uh, in the damage to other countries. Could you please say some, uh, if you have any scientific data, what kind of harm can be caused to other countries if Rogun is constructed, for example? Or not only Rogun, but also other big um, hydropower plants in the region, including Kambar Atta in uh, Kyrgyzstan, about which we have also very big debates. Therefore, could you please say something about this? Thank you very much. <coughs> and, uh, it is very sad to, to hear that problem. I'm, I'm really familiar with the problem of lack of electricity in the region. Uh, but uh <coughs> I have talked with uh, with a number of uh, officials from Tajikistan and listened to their presentations, and uh, I was uh, said that uh, the construction of exactly the Rogun Dam. There, in fact, there are uh, plans of uh, constructing of numerous dams in Tajikistan, uh, given the fact that it has very huge hydropower. Uh, hydropower potential, yeah. sorry. And uh, concerning the Ragum Dam itself, the officials were saying that uh, the g power, hydropower generated from this plant will be mainly uh, directed to, to, the, uh, to the export to South Asia and to support the uh, aluminium factory. So the use for, for, for this dam um, was set as the industrial and, and economic. And, <coughs> and the lack of electricity is, the, is related to some kind of mismanagement and the uh, lack of cooperation with other countries in the region because it, it was said before that uh, the, there wasn't any political uh, issues because water was, th there was a uh, one 
unified a, a electric grid in the region, so the countries could could uh, transfer power to each other during summer, winter. So it is well known. And concerning scientific uh, data, uh, you mean on Ragun Dam itself? Mm -hmm. as you mm -hmm. pointed yes. out in I your presentation. I, <coughs> I think that we should not focus only on Rogun. Mm -hmm. We should, yes. we are talking You're about right. the central Asian yes. issues here. Yes, and the construction of huge hydropower plants, huge dams, nowadays are discussed all over the world. And for example, the United States or European countries have already left this idea. Uh, and there are some considerations for that. <coughs> for example, uh, uh, they are they they cause the the change of the ecosystem on the river, right? And uh, and there is also uh, concerns related to seismic activity. For example, in the region. And let me go back to the to the earthquake in uh, in China, which was in 2009, if I'm not mistaken, in uh, Sichuan province, right? And <coughs> there are numerous uh, research on this issue, and uh, many scientists uh, show as the reasons for that uh, hu uh, very uh, huge earthquake is that the few years ago before that earthquake uh, the, uh, the very high dam was built nearby and it was placed on the tectonic fault and uh, the uh, the data from 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 them that dam shows that the earthquake happened after uh, a uh, withdrawal of huge amount of water so I'm not expert in that field but this is uh, sci scientific articles. Yes, back here, please. Okay, uh, my name is Aibia Kumakev, Embassy of Kyrgyzstan. Uh, first, I would like to say that thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and uh, second uh, is uh, uh, I would like to inform this everybody uh, that we have uh, uh, c some commissions, water commissions with Kazakhstan and with Tajikistan, and uh, these commissions. Um, uh, uh, in in these commissions, we discuss about how we have to use water uh, between our countries and. Uh, we try to establish same commission with Uzbekistan, but uh, and many times we invite uh, government uh, of Uzbekistan to discuss for establish uh, the same commission and talking uh, about uh, how we um, have to use waters between our countries. But um, uh, government of Uzbekistan. Um, uh, don't uh, send some delegates to Kyrgyzstan and, and do not uh, invite us to Tashkent. It's the first. And second, uh, as you know, this um, uh, project of Kambarata um, uh, was uh, um, uh, it, 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 it uh, was adopted by uh, Tashkent Institute. I, I don't remember this exactly name of this institute. It was many, many, many years ago in Soviet Union, but uh, it was uh, uh, Tashkent Institute. Um, and uh, you know this, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan is uh, op um, already open for talking. Is this, is this leading to a question? Yes, yes. And uh, uh, just a moment. Uh, this question is uh, what? Uh, very difficult to discuss with any side 
uh, when this side just ignore. And question is why government of Uzbekistan do not talk with Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan? Let, let, and let do, me do, let do me let me ask you in return. Uh, I've heard people from several of your neighboring countries say that Kyrgyzstan refuses to acknowledge the geopolitical game in which it itself is actively involved with this power plant. No, Kyrgyzstan uh, uh, don't, don't mean, say it, it, this is geopolitical. This, doesn't this just lead mm. to an endless cycle of accusations? Yeah. I mean, for example, uh, n there is no mention here of the Ili River. China's been taking vast amounts of water out of that forever. And I'm not aware that there's a Ili River commission between Kazakhstan and China. Maybe there is, if there's, if there's nothing has happened. Okay, J just right now we do not talk about China. We no, talk no, about I, I just Central Asia countries, yes? But, but, but excuse <laughs> me, that's part of the water system. It's a major yes, tributary. And uh, first, what is the problem? Problem is when one side do not to talk with other side. It's the first question. Why? We many times invite okay. Uzbekistan experts to so Kyrgyzstan. Thank you. It's the first. Second no, question. You, that's, let's cut it there. Let's hear okay. an answer. So I, I will say the same thing about uh, some other countries. So you are concentrating on Uzbekistan and uh, and there are nu in the media there are numerous articles by uh, so-called scientists who are trying to 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 find some reasons for the for the this problem, and uh, they don't go far than ac accusing uh, the the sides, and it is a trend in media. So and many people uh, are affected by by that trend. And <coughs> uh, concerning the lack of cooperation, uh, I don't see that Uzbekistan refused to its uh, neighbors. I see it from, it's the problem for the whole region. So on one aspect, the upper stream countries are uh, uh, Neglect, neglect the interests of downstream countries, and <coughs> and you j you have just said about the uh, planning of uh, uh, Kambarata by Tashkent Institute. Yes, you are right, and it was uh, planned during the Soviet Union, and you know how the decisions were made in the Soviet Union, and and. Going back to Rogun, <laughs> sorry, stopping on this problem. Uh, <coughs> again, I have talked to many uh, Tajik experts on water, on on hydro engineering, and Tajik's officials themselves they argue construction of this project, and and uh <coughs> and the the scientific uh, economic. Uh, uh, research for construction of, of, of the hydropower plants uh, were carried out in up to uh, 10 years and it is a very short time for for making decision because uh, we have a, a impact on the environment impact on the on the flow of the river impact on the on the uh, mountain sy systems them, them themselves here is the question of seismicity so why not all ca countries come together do you see the any utility to the model for example of the Mekong River where the Asian Development Bank over mm -hmm. what 20 years has worked to put together a Mekong Basin entity to uh, are there any international models that would be bene could be beneficially applied to Central Asian water issues? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> it is 
of course the world have uh, a d d has a d d d different different examples of uh, the uh, efficient cooperation on river resource on the rivers transboundary rivers lakes and uh, the question is that uh, there isn't any ready-made solution to emulate in the region because the region has its uh, own uh, uh, characteristics on that side and <coughs> and going back to the region as you mentioned the cooperation between Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan on river Chu and Talas is uh, is one of the good examples also Th there are some frictions and problems on that direction but somehow it is some kind of uh, uh, good solution to the problem but again even within the region of Central Asia you cannot emulate the model of that river to, to, to Amudarya and Serdarya because uh, Upstream countries uh, point to the uh, agricultural uses of water, uh, and uh, today, with the rising population in in Central Asia, uh, the food security issues will will be will be even more important. So, you just cannot uh, drop ir irrigation and and etc. So, yes, sir. Hi, my name is Farhoud. I'm the DCM of Tajikistan. Doesn't work. Does stand up, you'll be heard better. Okay. It's not on. Here it comes another one. Okay. Right, it, 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 start, start over. Thank you very much. My name is Fahod. I'm from Tajikistan Embassy here. Well, very nice presentations. Uh, you have mentioned Rogun more than you have mentioned the name of the water, although the subject was the management, the water management of the, uh, uh, the region. I have a few questions and also a comment, my friend. When you speak, uh, when you said several times about the issue of the water scarcity in the region, uh, uh, you did mention them, but don't you think the main reason of all these difficulties, I mean, the water management that we have already, I mean, in these days we already almost lost the Aral Sea, we don't have, I mean, almost we don't have it. Uh, and uh, you didn't even mention that uh, our esteemed Uzbek, your country, produces four million tons of cotton, which of course uses the water. And you didn't mention the artificial uh, lakes that uh, you are continuing to build in Uzbekistan. It's more than 200 of them. You have, but at the same time you have mentioned more than 20 times Rogun hydropower station power, uh, in Tajikistan, the dam of which is not even started yet. D did you know that the Rogun dam is not started yet? I mean, it is on the paper, it is on the project. At the same time, did you know that the World Bank at these days doing the feasibility study of the Rogun? And also, the World Bank is working with all countries of the region on the Rogun issue. The last meeting of the World Bank, the experts, been in Almaty of Kazakhstan. Kyrgyzstan was there, Tajikistan Thank was there, the Turkmenistan was there, that. and you know who was not there? Uzbekistan didn't present there. So now if you mention the Rogun more than 25 times, but you don't mention the real cause of the water problem that is created, then, you know, it is just disregard of the audience, I believe. Thanks. <coughs> Mentioned of mentioning of that particular uh, dam was related to the questions of my uh, colleague from Tajikistan sitting next to you. 
and I didn't dwell attention on that. And <coughs> so going through your questions step by step. So <coughs> yes, there are ongoing feasibility studies which are undertaken by the World Bank. They are, they, they are uh, studying the uh, social economic ass ass assessment impact and the uh, environment, have I mentioned the environmental? Social environmental, yeah. yes, and technical side of that. And uh, the, I will not, <laughs> the Rogun is being constructed right now and there are uh, many signs of that and uh, and uh, in in many of the discussions in the region and across the world uh, the the experts and diplomats they are pointing to that problem saying that uh, constru construction should be stopped until the assessments are finished and if I, I will not speculate on the results of uh, the uh, feasibility studies we, because we don't have them at hand and uh, about cotton uh <coughs> you, the can I can I interrupt here uh, you, you raised in your report a very interesting question. Uh, you pointed out that we continue, by and large, to talk about these issues as if Afghanistan doesn't exist. But look at, the, look at your own maps. There is Afghanistan r right as a source of the Amu Darya. Uh, there are a number of rivers coming in from the Pamirs on the Afghan side, and therefore it is a potential e very significant producer uh, and interestingly and this is quite distinctive it is also potentially a very significant user because when you get further downstream you are going past some wonderful agricultural land which for 2,000 years was farmed and isn't farmed today because they can't get the water out of the out of the Amadarya tell me tell me this is I mean it's inevitable that Afghanistan is going to become a player is it going to be an upstream country or a downstream country or both and does how is its presence serious presence going to change the game there is uh, a very important point because uh, large amount of water also comes from Afghanistan and before the collapse mm, of the Soviet Union there have been numerous uh, uh, plans uh, in, in Afghanistan uh, either supported by Soviet engineers on construction of uh, a number of uh, hydropower plants inside Tajikistan uh, mainly for irrigation needs of the country and today uh, based on estimates they, they vary uh, source to source uh, Afghanistan takes only two cubic kilometers of water and uh, it's a it will be obvious it will be growing in the nearest future uh, and it is should be addressed by the countries and I haven't looked deep on, on that side of the problem but, but it's even been ignored in the in the Rogun discussion I mean it hi Daryl Fields from the World Bank um, in fact the um, Afghan has been involved in in the um, in the studies and in the repairing consultations for Rogun, it has not been ignored in, in the Rogun studies. But those don't go into the future and to the, to the future as a potential electricity producer, in other words, future dams. It's, it's, it takes, I've long meetings on this. 
It's taken a rather short time frame. It's not asking what is it likely to be during the life of the dam as a producer uh, upstream uh, Afghanistan and downstream as a, as a, con as a user of water. Yeah, very conservative and short-term estimates. The, the Rogan studies look at the Rogan project itself. It doesn't do a cumulative impacts that's assessment. Yeah, and that's, that's in fact a cumulative impacts of the whole system would not be a normal way of doing an assessment of a single project. But having, no, just, just excuse me, excuse me. But having said that, though, I think you raise a very good pro point in terms of assessment of the basins is important from a strategic perspective. So I, I don't think we need to put it on the Rogan project, but I do think we need to put it on the discussion and the cooperation amongst what I would say are the six Central Asian countries or the six Al Mudaria Sirdaria Basin countries. And that is a gap that currently exists, um, very much so in terms of discussion about cooperation, discussion about water allocation, and things like that. And I, I would have a question for probably all of the representatives of the Central Asian countries here in terms of what do you see as a viable way of including Afghanistan in the consideration of water management, transboundary water management in Central Asia? What do you think are the steps or the institutions that would allow that to happen? That's a question directed to everyone <laughs> present. Yeah, please. Thank you. So previously, I have heard that uh, uh, after that uh, Afghan officials have participated to numerous uh, uh, events, uh, gatherings on water in the region, uh, including the International Fund for Saving the RLC, which is the main institution in the region, and uh, the the governments in the region, they, many of them recommend uh, taking into consideration Afghanistan, and Afghanistan shows today more interest in involving in that. And here you raise very important side of the issue, I have just touched upon on that, uh, that there is no institution uh, in the region that uh, covers not only all the countries, but all water resources, that is the surface water, groundwater, and uh, returning waters from, from, from fields. D ca ca tell us, all of you, what kind of, what kind of institute you, you presented uh, th that this would be a nice thing to have, and I think everyone here agrees that it would be a nice thing to have, but if we had it, we wouldn't have the, the, the issues that were addressing. Can any of you give us a thumbnail sketch of that institution that would work? What? Wait. Well, go ahead. Regarding uh, the involvement of Afghanistan, sorry, if I understood you correctly, your question was about the involvement of Afghanistan into this issue. I think that here um, in the region, a lot of projects are being implemented, uh, especially now uh, Aga Khan uh, Development Network has been implementing some projects. Very in, small uh, ones. Yeah. Well, uh, they are actually much more beneficial than rather other big projects which do not that have, was what he was <laughs> <arguing>. <laughs> sorry, uh, they are mostly, uh, uh, this pro the goal of these projects are mostly to, um, uh, to uh, connect Tajikistan and Afghanistan from one point of view, which would further uh, connect Afghanistan with the whole Central Asian region. And uh, uh, some, uh, there is now also a discussion about the construction of another uh, hydropower plant in Pyanj River, which, is, which flows between Tajikistan and Afghanistan. I think that Afghanistan has actively been involved in these issues, in uh, water management issues in the region. I hope that this uh, was some kind of response. Sorry uh, just for taking your time again. In terms of your response to Rogun again, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so this was, this became presentation about Rogun, I think. Uh, regarding, uh, you pointed out about the earthquake. We t need to take into account one point that Rogun will be constructed in Tajikistan, not in Uzbekistan. And if Megot does not happen, there is some kind of earthquake. First and worst, 
Tajikistan will be the country who will suffer, not Uzbekistan first. Therefore, why Tajikistan would be interested in, in putting its, itself under a risk by undertaking these initiatives? We should also pay attention to the side of the issue. And also, um, we need to provide scientific data. Sorry, we are here conducting research. We are not just from the high school, which we can talk based on the rumors. Therefore, I would be much more grateful if you could in the future take into account the scientifically grounded ideas. And I also would be much more grateful if you could point out which Tajik officials argued the construction of Rogun hydropower plant. Thank you. And <clears throat> the research is mainly based on uh, scientific research. Again, I'm not the expert in uh, hydro engineering, seismicity, but that is what experts, real experts on the ground are seeing. And the answer for the fir for the, your question is that uh, any constructions on transboundary rivers, which the Amudaria is, uh, should, should have a assessment of the impact on the whole region because it it will somehow change the flow of the river. Uh, and the can you can you give us the? Can any of you sketch in in a few sentences, what an appropriate and effective region wide consultative body of the sort that you recommended in your talk, what it would look like one that would work. And is there a model anywhere else in the world that can be? I am glad that you brought the discussion back to the institutional nature of, of uh, water. The only institution that I can, can you think introduce of. introduce yourself. I'm Nick Wundra with the Russia Eurasia Department here at SICE. Sorry. The only institution that I can think of now that does this effectively is the EU. And the only uh, non-institutional arrangements that do work regarding water resources are pre-colonial arrangements. So I'm thinking of the Nile River with Egypt, Chad, and, and other countries. I'm thinking of the development of the Ohio River here in the United States during the United States expansion. I don't know if there's any legal uh, regime to draw upon pre-independence and pre-colonization for Central Asian countries, but I think this would be a global first for the Central Asian states, which are newly independent, to create a water regulation institution among themselves, all six, possibly including China, possibly Iran as well, and perhaps even Pakistan. I, I don't know what this would look like, but with, without any sort of EU push or other EU institutions, I don't see it being very effective because we have this problem of upstream and downstream and the interests between those conflict as opposed to the EU institutions which make all of those issues inclusive. There are no upstream or downstream countries in, in the EU context. How do we get to that in Central Asia? I don't know. Yes, please. Um, Kamala Kabil Janova, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, could issue linkage possibly contribute to the diffusion of the problem politically, meaning uh, linking issues of trade, agriculture, and water together when looking at um, the region? So in terms of cooperation on energy issues, not looking at just water problems, but also looking at possibly improving the relationship between these countries through trade and through agriculture cooperation. and therefore helping the diffu diffuse the problem that way. <coughs> uh, this, this point uh, has a, it could be leading to the uh, cooperation of the countries because where are the eco economic I interests? Uh, there are solutions for that and uh, uh, and uh, for example, there was an agreement uh, in 1998 on the Sirdaria River, and it was um, a 
the beginning it was somehow cooperative because countries agreed on a uh, change of it, uh, on the exchange of uh, energy resources, water resources, and it raises another question, which is which is uh, the characteristic of the region: lack of integration. So, and by the way, the uh, institution on water today is the only existing institutions which gathers all the countries in the region. I mean, uh, Central Asian countries from Soviet Union, not Afghanistan. But <coughs> this is the direction we should, I should be looking. Thank you. Yes, please. I have a question. I'm Marie Snyder from this institute. Um, the chart that you showed early on uh, uh, concerning usage of water and the levels of usage per country were really shocking. They're thirsty in Turkmenistan. <laughs> um, my question is, uh, has this, by the way, this, uh, this particular event that we're holding tonight is also in a series of s at size on the year of agriculture. So concerning water use, it's an agriculture. I, I know that there are a lot of methods by which water usage can be minimized and agricultural production maintained high and even improved. The, just the, the methods of watering uh, can vary greatly. So what, since there is such a huge amount of water being used, presumably a lot of it also for agriculture, what's being done to reduce water usage for growing crops, be it cotton or whatever? Mm -hmm. <coughs> there are solutions for saving water and uh, part particular exam of tur example of Turkmenistan, it's a very, uh, has a very arid climate compared to all the region. It mainly consists of uh, the deserts and the Karakum Canal, which I showed you. Uh, it it uh, causes very huge losses of water because of uh, seepage. It just goes on sand without any lining. And uh, lining is the simplest solution for water supply. Uh, um, and uh, there are a lot of uh, water, uh, water saving measures. For example, uh, I have heard a lot of uh, a lot about uh, introduction of drip irrigation in Uzbekistan, in Kazakhstan. Uh, there are a lot of projects on doing that, but there isn't any uh, any coordination sometimes between uh, donoring, donor society. Uh, there are very, f these projects are very fragmented in the region. And, and another issue which can be related to the previous question, uh, gains from <coughs> energy resources could be, uh, the part of them could be diverted to the uh, supporting um, irrigation systems in the region. That's it. If lot of lot of questions. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Aaron Bays. I work with CNFA. We do agricultural projects actually in, in Central Asia. And just to address your question, we've worked with several water users associations on drip irrigation adoption. In Central Asia? And yeah, in Central Asia and in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. Um, and we've seen about 80% reduction in water use among the, the associations that have adopted drip irrigation. The problem is actually getting the equipment in. It's really difficult to, uh, to import. And also a lot of the associations don't see any, any purpose to it since the water doesn't cost them anything. Um, and just a, sort of a question to you. A, a lot of times we see... Well, Excuse uh, me, just on that. Yeah. Do you, does your organization therefore support marketization? <laughs> uh, I, I, in general, I don't think my uh, my organization has a uh, has a has a stance on that officially. Water is a human right. Um, it's it's difficult to price it, but uh, but if you're going to be uh, 
making, uh, facilitating access, uh, maybe we should be paying for, for the access. I don't know, that's, that's my two cents. Um, but uh, so often we, we hear this debate phrased as, as one between the energy uses and the agricultural uses. But you also alluded to the need for, for economic diversification. Um, what, what's being done to diversify, um, diversify the, the economic uh, opportunities available um, to, to sort of reduce the pressure on the water? Thank you for the view from practitioner side. <laughs> and what is, uh, it is b what is being done in the region today? And uh, <coughs> um, in many countries, uh, we see the process of the, uh, of the, of this issue. For example, uh, if we go to numbers on Uzbekistan, uh, during last 10 years, it uh, has largely reduced uh, the, its agriculture composition of uh, GDP from, if I'm not mistaken, from, sorry, I don't <laughs> remember the numbers, that that was a drastic change, d decrease in that numbers. And About 30% reduction in, in land that's being irrigated. Mm -hmm. That, that is also in here and uh, for example uh, it also includes in within the agricultural sector itself diversification of the crops uh, so for example in the case of Uzbekistan uh, b before independence the cotton uh, was a composed six, 60 percent something in the composition of cr other crops in agriculture. Today it is re reduced to less than 30 percent. So in the including uh, introduction of uh, wa lower water use crops, including the uh, contraction of uh, lands, irrigated lands. So that's it. And yes, please, sir. Good evening, Steve Holder. This has been a fascinating discussion and lots of emotion and I finally come to the conclusion that I think we have to commercialize water. Um, <clears throat> I mean, if you, I lived in Ukraine for a few years in Western Ukraine. Nobody was ever charged for water so they just let water run all the time. And if you're not charged for water, you don't appreciate water. Water is a human right. But you have to have some kind of discipline. I mean, <clears throat> I know this will be very controversial, but I think the people building Rogan ought to charge the downstream riparian for building the dam because they're holding the water up there so you get water to irrigate your uh, cotton later on. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I know that's outrageous, but uh, yes. w w water is a commodity. <laughs> and I'm going to get slugged here in a minute. Water is a commodity that, that, that people need to appreciate and can't just say, I'm going to turn on the tap and it's going to come out. So th there has to be some discipline put into this whole thing in all of Central Asia, all six countries, and people need to get together. The, the Mekong River Association that you spoke of is a conglomeration of disparate countries, but the biggest player is not playing. Yeah, that's that's right. China. That's right. They're an observer. Yeah. So I mean, everybody has to play. If you have one person that takes their toys from the sandbox and doesn't play, then nothing gets, nothing gets solved. And, and by the same comparison, uh, the Colorado River I mean, it, you could say Los Angeles is Uz Uzbekistan. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, don't, and, don't talk and, to the Mexicans and, either. <laughs> and, and, you, and this has not, this has not a, been a very functional relationship either. No, yes, Nick. I am glad that you bring up Colorado. I'm from Colorado, and I worked in the state senate there on water issues for, for many years. I'm glad to say that the Colorado once again reaches the Pacific Ocean. LA no longer uses 100% of the flow. <laughs> we, uh, the right RLC. after my, pardon? The RLC. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Right after my uh, answer to your question about institutional makeup of what water regulation and administration might look like, we had a comment about linkages and other sorts of issues. So my first question to Elbeck is what sorts of issues would create these 
linkages. And second, is, is there a missed opportunity in the Eurasian Trade and Customs Union to perhaps be the institutional vehicle for those linkages? We don't like to talk about Russia. We, we, we view Russia mainly in the United States as this imperial actor, but could this be a positive role for the Putin Medvedev administration to um, undertake better regulation and monetization of uh, water? So, <clears throat> Russia itself has long been involved in water disputes in the region, and uh, that didn't bring any positive results for the region, for the peoples of the region, because they are always trying to exert pressure on either side to 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 have their their interest they have o their own interest in the region so <coughs> and i don't think that the uh, the problem could be solved by pressure outside by outside players who pursue their own national interests and the other side link you mentioned about linkages so, of course, uh, economic cooperation, energy cooperation in the sphere of energy, agriculture can 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 put s can give some input to the solving of the problem itself. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is, this has been a lively and interesting session. I I really thank all of you who've who've pitched in. Uh, it's it's been wonderful, really. I'm very happy that you all were here. Uh, we're honored to have you. Uh, a quick couple of comments. One, uh, with regard to the question of an entity, there was a Central Asia Union. Uh, Russia asked to join. It was it was doing all sorts of things. It was a, it was much more impressive operation. Russia asked to join. Once Putin joined, he then immediately set about destroying it, and 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 that's what it was merged into something else, a and Eurasian. which which they conclude, uh, namely the Eurasian Union, which which is a very different balance. So there was and uh, there was something within Central Asia. The question I think you've raised, and several of you have raised, a fundamental issue: is this something, which the all countries, and I w would agree with you, it seems to me China's part of the story because of the Illy, but the, all the countries that are directly involved in the, in the watershed should solve, or is it something that they should solve in the context of a, a, a bunch of external entities of whether they're financial institutions or, or countries, uh, in other words, is it going to be solved from within or without, and, and what is the mutual balance between them? I, I, it seems to me, from all I hear from people working in this field there, that Central Asians know a lot of more about each other than we do about them. And therefore, the real solutions are going to come from within the region. Uh, that, that they should be the ones seeking external advice and counsel rather than external advice and counsel coming and telling them, uh, here's our expertise, uh, here's what we ought to do. Uh, you know, this has been complicated by the fact that this is a post-colonial situation. Uh, and, and one can expect, I think one of the questions, I, if, if we had more time, I would love to have asked all of you, uh, you know, if you go to the meetings I did a couple of times of the of the water gurus of Central Asia, uh, these are old dogs who, you know, the joke tellers club where everyone numbered the jokes because they've heard them. So they, they know they've worked they've worked with each other for thirty years. They know each other. They're real. They're they're all the graduates of the same hydrological institutes and so on in Soviet times. I would ask, and, and by the way, with all the prejudices of Soviet uh, uh, irrigation theory, I, I would be very interested to know what younger people coming up uh, are going to do to this situation. I mean, there, there, there's going to be a new crowd. 
and, and I'd be fascinated to know that. On the question, though, of post-colonial, you, know, you know, when a huge amount of damage is done by one country to another, uh, the normal thing to talk about is some form of reparations. Now, the, the Soviet Union is no more, but the Russian Federation assumed its legal, uh, 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 it became its legal heir. And, and I think a striking thing here is the absence of any sense of responsibility on the Russian side for what it did to this region. On the, in the, and, and, you know, it's, it's fine. We can debate Uzbeks and, and Tajiks and Kyrgyz, Ta Turkmen, Afghans till the end of time. But they're all dealing with a, with a problem they didn't create. And, and it seems to me the world community has done a miserable job with apologies to our friends from the World Bank. Why? Why? Because on the one hand, there has never been a serious discussion of how, for example, to put some kind of lining on the bottom of the Karakum Canal. I mean, in other words, to correct this monster problem which is causing all this tension within the region. The international financial community is, you know, it's, I mean, this one's too big for us. We can't touch it. I don't know what the reason is, but there is no big, you know, this it seems to me is, is a problem of a scale that warrants a huge international investment. Just in the form of, if you will, reparations of, of the damage that was inflicted. Final point, it seems to me, my impression is that the international involvement on this has often been at a very high technical level. If you read, for example, the chapter in our Fergana Valley book that Christina Bixel from Switzerland did, it's, it's very competent and a lot of real knowledge behind it. A lot of, there's real expertise. However, the international expertise has refused to acknowledge that there are also geopolitical issues at stake. It hasn't taken them into account. I was at a very senior meeting at the, at the World Bank with the vice president, the same at the IMF, where uh, you know, they'd done wonderful research on, uh, of a technical nature. I don't, I, I disagree with you. I don't think you can solve this just by dealing with the technical issues. I think you have to be very candid about what, the, what are the security issues and the geopolitical issues. There are very serious games being played. International techies don't like to talk about it. But it will never be advanced until that is fed into it. So, you know, we haven't touched that today. That's something for another time. I'd welcome anyone who's prepared to speak on that to do so. But it, all the projects that we're talking about have very serious geostrategic implications, which, in fact, motivate all kinds of responses on all sides. And you cannot bury these under technical problems. So, so I, I just leave you with that. I, I want to, again, thank all of you. You've really been wonderful. Thanks for coming. And Elbeck, thank you very much. Thank you so much.